Good morning and welcome to this week's Jump Recruitment Discussion. This week we're going to be talking about one of the major boardroom items from 2022 and an absolute must when it comes to succeeding in 2023. Are your retention strategies working? Have you stopped the revolving door? But as usual, we're going to get you some, some stats. We're going to talk about some generic stats and then we're going to talk about recruitment stats as well, just so people understand there. So these are generic stats about the workforce in general. 40% of employees that don't rate their manager's performance highly have interviewed for a job in the last three months. What's more, 56% think managers are promoted prematurely and 60% think their managers need training. According to the Tiny Pulse data, 21.5% uh, of employees that don't feel recognized when they do a great job at work have interviewed in the last three months, compared to only 12.4% of those who feel recognized. Employees who don't feel comfortable giving upward feedback to their managers are 16% less likely to stay at a company, and employees that are 23% more likely to stay with a manager who clearly explains their roles and responsibilities. Millennials are 22 times more likely to work for a company that's got a high culture of trust, and employees who rate their work-life balance are 10% more likely to stay with a company. In addition, the studies of the European, oh, sorry, the Employee Engagement uh, Survey by Kronos found that 95% of HR leaders admit that employee burnout is sabotaging the workforce retention. Companies that support remote working have a 25% lower employee turnover than companies don't. And McKenzie did a global research found that the percentage of people who left their jobs without having a job to go to was round about 40%. That's really Ooh, interesting. Oh, yeah. really Rep interesting. Reports which gathered data from 500 UK business leaders also revealed that high staff turnover has led to 23% of the business receiving complaints from remaining team members about the change in company culture. The UK average employment turnover rate is approximately 15% a year, although obviously that varies between industries. The recruitment sector, which is obviously renowned for having a high turnover rate, is still averaging at 43%. However, what they did add new to this uh, survey this year was with a cost of replacing a consultant sitting at around about 400% of their salary, not to mention loss of fees whilst new starters get up to speed. So this is something that most sort of agencies basically can't afford at the moment. So we need to be sort of looking at that and why that works. Okay, so today, joined by the whole jump team, which is, should be really good fun. We're going to argue about who's going to come in on the first question, as always. Uh, it won't, won't be Heather, because I know she's a fear of the first question, first question nerves. So we'll probably go to Heather first, just to sort of see what's going on. Yeah, so, let's do on that. this subject, Howard, I'm happy with first question. Right, brilliant. <laughs> okay, so the first question is, what is the capital of... No, so... <laughs> <laughs> We've talked an awful lot on all our webinars about retaining staff. So then go on, Heather. What do you believe in is the biggest reason agencies cannot hold on to their staff in 2023? It is genuinely a really thought-provoking question, Howard, because there are so many reasons. But for me, what's unique about 2023 is the cost of living crisis. And so it is money uh, I think is the biggest one which I think there are millions right and I think Paul's getting ready to argue <laughs> argue with me but <laughs> many recruitment businesses continue to hire people whose sole motivation for being in the business is money um, and then some of those people are then surprised when those people go and leave because somebody offers them a little bit more money um, or a slightly tweaked commission scheme or something and this year it, you know it makes a difference so um this will amaze you Heather I don't disagree <laughs> although <laughs> I don't entirely agree I'm somewhere in the middle I think look you can't ignore the fact that you need to make certain that your people are paid the inverted commas going rate I mean to be behind the curve isn't a good place to be to try to be the best um, payers 
uh, in terms of salary benefits and bonus plans and so forth is futile because there's always going to be somebody out there that will be able to, to do better than you and so forth. So I think it is, you're entirely right. Obviously, the spiraling, spiraling cost of inflation is, is a big consideration. Having said that, and here's where I slightly depart from your perspective, and that is that I think one of the points I would make about the salary issue is that obviously consultants, particularly in the current market, have every opportunity to do very well if they apply themselves. The market's in every sense, still very buoyant. This is not, as we know, a recession. There are, was it 1.2, 1.3 million vacancies out there. It's unrelenting volumes of opportunity. And so if um, we've got consultants who are hungry to improve their financial status, they've, they've got every opportunity to do that, obviously, through getting more perm placements, um, increasing fee levels, which is enough subject for another day, um, pick, getting more temp bookings and contractors out and so forth. The thing that I would say about retaining staff and being one of the largest and most important factors comes down to emotion. I know you're going to enjoy, you'll, you'll agree with me here that this is about people feeling valued in a business. And, you know, we can apply financial measures in terms of do we pay enough and all the rest of it. But you all know, and so do I, people that work for businesses on less money than they could definitely earn elsewhere because they've bought into the kudos and, sorry, into the, into the uh, the methods and the culture and so forth, the vision, the missions of the businesses they work for. In other words, they've successfully bought those people's hearts and minds, those organisations. And for me, if you lose people, um, it's generally uh, about their uh, their um, attitude towards the business rather than money, and that tends to be my experience. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you at Could all. Could you record? This is recorded, isn't it? How? <laughs> she did say, I agree with you, Paul. You d- <laughs> I want that on record. Yeah, no, I com- I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the, the, the Paul Jacobs sponsored by KP Nuts uh, half hour is, <laughs> is, 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 is definitely on. Dave, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, I think uh, in 2023, the biggest reason why people... Um, can't hold on to their staff is they have no idea what keeps them there in the first place Mm -hmm. i am amazed i'm constantly amazed that when i'm talking to leaders of businesses and they say oh so and so left so and so left they've moved on and then you dig into why is that they're like well i think they've just gone for more money and they start off with that question of i think i think they've done this i think it's because of this i think it's they said this they said this they said and, and they just don't know. They don't know why they're staying and they only find out when they leave. And I think that's the biggest thing for 2023 is if we can understand why our people bother to work for us in whatever capacity, we'll have a greater chance of keeping them. That's a wise word, Dave. Very wise word. Oh, oh record that as well. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle of all of that because I think it's more about you know, what I'm talking to people is when, when you find out that they left it, is that I don't think they really feel that they know what their part to play is in the business, no. that they're just there as a number on a, on a spreadsheet to be earning revenue, and yeah. there's no real purpose for them to be there other than gen- generate money, which sort of crosses over what everyone said, really, to a certain degree. Um, but I think it's it's important that we've got to recognise that. And I think the bigger thing at the moment this year is last year, you know, we, we we held on to our big billers quite well in, in most cases. So if we think about this year, I've seen lots of companies at the moment this year lose quite a lot of their big billers. So what impact does a big biller or a long-term employee leaving have on the business? Well, the, the thing about the big billers for me, Howard, is that 90% of recruitment businesses aren't made up of big billers. Most recruitment businesses have some big billers, which is mm. fantastic for all of us. Mm. But most of them are between that, you know, maybe if, if we're talking, remember, we're not just talking about salespeople. Recruitment businesses are many salespeople, but the support people, there's HR, there's marketing, there's, there's all of the things that make our businesses work. Um, and most of them are made up of people that do okay. And doing okay is okay. And it's those people, when we lose those, that has the biggest effect on, on our businesses. Um, the, obviously, when the big builders leave, you lose the organisational DNA, you lose a customer, or you can lose the customer relationships, 
it means quite obviously you lose a, you lose a lot of revenue. And perhaps most importantly for the bigger billers, you lose the opportunity for the rest of the staff to look up to people who are doing really, really well. And that drives accelerated performance for the people who aren't doing quite as well as they are. Yeah. And that doesn't matter what the discipline is, whether yeah. it's sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's social that, media, whatever it is. Yeah, so, I'd, I'd, add to, I'd add to that, David, I think because I think that's right. But I think it depends on who the big biller is. Hmm. So we've all seen situations where you've got big billers who are, frankly, diva would be a better <laughs> description. <laughs> Uh, of them. <laughs> and actually what you find when they do leave is that suddenly there's more opportunity hmm. in yeah, that yeah, area yeah. of the business yeah, true. they were actually yeah, yeah. holding back growth in yeah, and yeah. i've seen so many examples of high billing diva consultants that when they leave or are exited um you know from the business suddenly you can put a team of 10 in yep. that area yep. who all become pretty blooming good you know, uh, uh, and overall, you're in a position to exploit that market yep. better than you were with one. Um, so, so I don't think we should always see it as a negative. Sometimes, depending on their their modus operandi, their impact on culture, actually, it can be an opportunity. I think the, you're both absolutely correct. Again, you can recall that. I think um, it's. Um, it depends, as you rightly say, Heather, who it is. It can be shock that people that are long standing have been with the business a long time are leaving. Uh, it can affect morale if they're if they're valued and people look up to them, as Dave said. Um, they've been part of the business for many, many years, and it, it does send a shockwave through the business. You know, why is this person somebody that was had the, the, the sort of initials of the business running through their veins. Why is that individual leaving? What's going on? It causes people to feel unsettled and insecure sometimes if it's the right, as you say, the right kind of person. To pick up your point about divas, I think you called them. I think I've had a number of experiences, probably more than I'd care to mention over the years of, of very high billers who have been, as Howard always refers to them, internal terrorists. And you're right, when they've finally decided to move on uh, or they've been persuaded it's a good idea, uh, we have uh, been in a position to make a great deal more money and, in fact, morale improves. So I think the issue isn't about, uh, you know, the, the sort of question itself is about what impact does it have? It depends on the individual, doesn't it? It depends on who we're talking about and the impact they have, positive or negative, on the business. So it's interesting. Think, this is an aside for a little bit of humour. I did have a lady who worked for us once at Battle Hall called Bette Midler. <laughs> and, and, and just to paint the point, she was terrible. So <laughs> there was no, de no diva behaviour in her at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for that, Dave. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I think it's an interesting, wasn't it? Because you're right. Because you've got some big billers that are really sort of held on a pedestal within a business, aren't they? And you've got other big billers who are held in disdain by everybody else. And so you have those two effects that, you know, one's a positive effect, one's a, one's a negative effect when they leave. And I think it's... <laughs> The same thing when you look at it across the business is, I think, for junior employees or younger employees, it's why they're leaving, irrespective of whether they're liked or disliked, it's why they're leaving. And that causes a ripple that, you know, is it for money? Is it for better opportunities, etc., What whatever they're doing? And it still has a, a massive ripple effect on the junior people within the business that someone of that stature, irrespective of their like or dislike of that person, when they leave, it does cause, you know, fear. Why is that person leaving? And I think that's what I tend to see is that, that when that fear starts to accumulate, then it starts not a stampede, but it starts that trickle of other people looking for a job. And it's almost that that, that the big billers open the Pandora's box. Well, if that person's leaving, then perhaps I should be having a look around. And I think it's that that you've got to start to think about that, you know, if you've got a number of them leaving you know, in quick succession, it does cause a ripple effect. So we flip that question then. We know in the stats that we came out with 43% attrition rate in recruitment. So what is the main reason then that rookies don't get past year one? Well, it starts with how we recruit them. Yeah. Right. It starts with how we recruit them. I think if you looked across recruit that, if you really dug into those stats, Howard, I'd be really interested to see what the variation is 
because I think we all know recruitment businesses where they've got a way better retention rate of rookies than that. And it starts with real care about spotting potential in individuals and really deeply consciously thinking about what am I looking for? What is it that will make somebody successful in my business as a rookie? And then understand, understanding how you find that and how you spot it. And we have so many people in this industry, and it sounds stupid because we're the recruitment industry, but that who don't put enough conscious thought into what it is they're looking for in a in a rookie when when they are hiring a trainee and it's a kind of like well we just take on a few people and then you know by some weird osmosis they'll turn turn into a great recruitment consultant it's that conscious thought lots of other things on the journey but it starts with mm. are we hiring the right people in the first place absolutely and and i think then it comes down to as you and I'm, you're probably going to get to this. The the whole onboarding process and ongoing training and coaching of people isn't just, you know, as many recruitment businesses do, they offer very good training when people start, but then it towels off as time goes on. You know, if we accept, and we should accept the fact that it, it's it takes a lot of skill to do the job well. I mean, we talked earlier about big billers. It doesn't happen accidentally, regardless of somebody's personality. If you are successful in our business then you have developed a pretty strong and very high level of skill sets. It's not something that you can do easily. I mean, how many people, and there'll be nodding heads, I can't see them, but how many people uh, have come into our industry believing anyone, you know, it's easy to do recruitment and have left in a short period of time. And when we know it's not an easy job, it isn't. Now, if we know that that's the case, then our expectations of new people, especially in the first three to six months, shouldn't be that high in terms of their ability to produce revenue for us. I mean, obviously, we want to see some level and consistent level of improvement. But, you know, you simply don't take people on expecting to break even on those people within five, six months. It's lovely if you do, obviously, and occasionally we do, but generally it takes time. And I think we have to be patient with good quality people that we bring into the business and enable them to learn the trade, to use that expression, because they are going through an apprenticeship. And we then hopefully start to see a much better performance in the second six months. And then as I was discussing with somebody only on Monday, second year, really getting to grips and doing well. And third year, as they say these days, smashing it. But, you know, we have to manage our own expectations. And that means we have to pour a lot of resource and time and energy into the new people we bring on. I'd add we should be doing that for our existing people, too, but we'll probably come back to that shortly. I think also in our industry, a rookie with 12 months experience, one can expect that she or he would be quite good because they're still there after 12 months. They are like gold dust in our industry. So therefore our competitors are circling around looking at LinkedIn when they celebrate their, their 12 month anniversary and suddenly they're, they're under attack to try and leave the company. And if as leaders, we don't know the difference between the reason why they're staying, which is often different to the reason why they joined, then they're up, they're up for grabs, and and with twelve months' experience, they're very very valuable to some. Uh, I'll slightly dispute with you on this point, Mister Pye. Um, although I do agree with what you just said. Obviously, if somebody has progressed well, and after twelve months, you know you've developed them, they are absolutely a target for competitors, as we know. I, I would argue, though, that we often see people that are still in the business after twelve months when it's pretty obvious that they are bang average and not really going to make the grade but the truth is that the owners of the businesses feel that it's so hard to replace people so difficult to go out and find somebody else that they'll put up with mediocrity I, I you know we've all seen it and you look at people and think well why is this person still here when they clearly don't have what it takes and when you dig a bit it's the fear of losing someone an empty seat finding someone else yeah. better the devil you know attitude and you know our attitude has always been you know, it's not a it's not about how much is that person making. People will say to me, "Oh, well, they made X amount in the course of a year," and I always think, "Well, it depends on what you think that desk is worth." Rather than thinking, "Oh, well, we didn't lose money," but if that desk is worth, I don't know, let's say 120, 150 thousand, 
and the individual is way short of that, you're losing money, not 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 just breaking even and making a small profit. So I, I'm slightly disagreeing with you. I do think good quality people, absolutely right. But uh, we have a, a propensity to hold on to people sometimes longer than we should because of the fear of losing them and the aggravation of replacing them. So, so, I think so, the balance of those two things is really difficult, though, Paul. Yeah, the balance I agree. Of how do we decide that actually they're still worth investing in and, and they're on a trajectory that means the development is of value yes or and when we cut our losses effectively and actually i've seen just as many examples of people cutting their losses too soon yes true right then as people doing it and not being willing to 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 say actually this isn't right i've maybe i've also true yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. If, you, if you listen to the words that we've brought out there osmosis patient expectation mediocrity you know people are like gold dust you know we expect people to sort of come and perform through osmosis. And we know once you start doing a recruitment job, it's very different from what you did. Yeah, once you're six months into the job, it's very different to what you do when you're six days into the job. And yet we expect this person to understand that and that doesn't work. And you're right, we don't have the patience. We get rid of people too quickly and our expectations sometimes are far too high. And it's interesting that comment on mediocrity, Paul. You know, I've always said, you know, I'd love to find big billers and I love finding billers and creating big billers, but it's the mid tier people constantly that we're looking at. And I always look at that from a, an employee, employee curve. You've got 20% who are probably your bigger billers, you know, get out of the way and let them bill. You've got 60% though, who are your average billers. And the question is, which way are they going? Are they going up or are they going down? And that depends on how you're treating them. You've got 20% who are in your bottom seats. And the question is, A, are you in the right seat in the first place? Or B, do you get rid of the person? So you find out whether they're in the right seat in the first place and move them. But it's that 60%. If I can move that 60% up by... 10k and go from 110 to yeah. 120 yeah, then i yeah. make so much more money than taking a big biller and getting them to yeah. bill more you know another 10k because yeah. that's just one person yeah and i think what we've got to think about is that when new people come into the business they're looking up at everyone above and if they haven't got that harmonious recruitment business where people are succeeding and helping each other then when the rector x come which is what days were talking about they come and it's very easy to leave because they've solved such a great story that they're not seeing where they are. And that's the bit I think where I think it's now at six months, once you've got six months worth of recruitment experience, the rector X are in, the other recruitment agencies are, are in, and they're all selling this huge, great dream. And that goes back to that, you know, what does that dream look like? So if you're not delivering what you said in the first place to them when they came through the interview, then that's why people leave. And that leads on to the bigger uh, question. Howard, just, a, just a quick point. I mean, um, there is a difference between, you know, my view about mediocrity is not, it's, uh, it's not, you know, it's not acceptable performance, under acceptable performance. By the way, um, it's the thing that, you know, the reason why my old business office, Angel, just to completely smash it against your old business, mate, was because we <laughs> didn't put up with mediocrity. So that's all I've got to say about that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very, very interesting comment that we haven't got time to debate here. Yeah, he's, 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 as well. Can I just make a plea? We must, as leaders, spend our time and attention focusing on all the people in our recruitment businesses, not just the billers. Yes, yes, good point. Billers yeah. are unable to bill because the support services, because the marketing, because the HR, because all the other bits of our business enable that to happen. And sometimes as leaders, we can get wrapped up in you know, the leaderboard and all of this. And yet the people are actually making it happen who don't maybe earn as much, but have um, have such an important role to play. And I think it's important that we we don't forget that, that the recruitment business is, is that whole community, that whole squad, if you like, as that, that slide says. Well, let, let's push that then. So money, holidays, unlimited commission, working from home, incentives, inverted commas, good management are all reasons why employees stay. And every recruitment business offers that and sells that as an, e, a, 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 an EVP. OK. What do you believe then creates loyalty and longevity in staff? 
yesterday I was on site with uh, with one of our jump clients and our the FD of the company that I was with. Um, he came with some stats from a survey of 1.3 million salespeople. So given what I've just said, this was just the sales side, but yeah, at 1.3. And the top three motivators or the reasons why they stay, the top three were number one, fairness. Number two, camaraderie. Mm. Number three, achievement. Yep. There you go. And they, they're not on that list. I mean, they are in a different way, but fairness and camaraderie. Am I treated fairly? Am I trusted? Am I liked? In in being that, can I achieve here? And that's that's the reason across the sales of 1.3 million yep. people in the survey. And I thought that was quite good. That's I think it's a great that, piece of data. That's a really good piece of data. And, and I think it backs up what we've all said that you know, people that feel who feel valued who feel secure in their work, who enjoy, and I think the other thing we should add is the actual content of the work. Do they get, are they getting fulfillment out of what they're doing? People can get over a period of time jaded by doing the same things over and over. You know, there is a point at which even if they're performing well, you start to go back, you see that in all, all works, uh, on all walks of life, not just our industries. There's a point at which we need to give them new challenges, new opportunities, um, stretch them unless they particularly don't want to do those things. But, you know, giving them that kind of content that gives them that level of fulfillment and career aspirations, of course, come into this about you know, in terms of advancement, promotion. But you're absolutely right. It is about feeling valued. It's about feeling that you belong, a sense of camaraderie. I, I think all of those and some others are entirely the reasons why people stay in businesses. It's, it's interesting. part of that family, isn't it? Yeah, when, when I wrote the question, I thought about it and I went onto LinkedIn and I just would scroll down my LinkedIn channel and I went on the first 10 recruiters who had posted or the last 10 recruiters that posted on my channel and went to look at their businesses. Not one of them said anything that you came out with there, Dave, at all. Not one of them mentioned camaraderie. Well, not one of them mentioned this is a great cultural place that, you know, et cetera. It was all about money, holidays, unlimited commission, working from home, incentives, good management, etc. And that's what was, you know, what's been pushed at people. And what we're saying is that when you start to think about, I, I did get some stats on Gen X and, and, and what have you, and they were talking about, you know, they are all about the company culture. They are all about going to work for a company with, with the right culture. And that's why people like Apple are now the biggest business in the world because of their company culture retains their staff. And it's the young staff. You go to any Apple store, they're all, you know, early 20s kids, in my view, you know, but they've all got this great culture. And it's interesting that we're talking about creating a culture. We're not talking about creating a sales team or a sales force. We're cr talking about creating a culture that creates performance because people feel rewarded and camaraderie together and you start to look at you know any great sporting team it's a team that's really tight knit that really wins it's not a team of superstars it's the team that's tight knit that wins constantly and it's how they've been managed to believe that and you, you can see that in so many different ways so outstanding culture is really interesting that we look at that and i think long term and longevity in staff is the fact that you are loathe to meet your leave your friends because of the culture and it's a great place to be and so yeah. you make it a hard place to get into you make it a harder place to get out of yeah. and that means all the little things that break down as in you know cultural things that break down but we let slip you know they need to be addressed and it's those things that if you address then you start to create a very different business where people are looking after each other rather than looking after themselves. And I think recruitment is full of me, 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 rather than we, we, we. And, and I think it's really interesting the way you phrase the question, actually, because you say mm. every recruitment business appears to offer these. And, yeah. and the reality is that they, you know, they don't all offer these, particularly good, good management, right? One of, and all of those things that you're talking about to do with culture, Howard, really you've got to have good management because it's no good mm -hmm. the owner of the business or the founder of the business or the ceo of the business believing all of this if their managers aren't living and breathing it and understanding it and communicating it and and making that culture happen so for me good management 
is yeah. fundamental to all of all of those things the working from home debate i also think it's worth just commenting on as well because I, i'm aware of a lot of recruitment businesses that don't have working from home and also that particularly gen you talk about gen z and younger staff don't want to work from home um and so i, I do think flexibility around yeah. working from home is yeah. key it's that it's not all or one or the other it's really being aware of who wants what I, I kind of live example Heather. last week i was with a tech recruitment company and the, the leader a lady who, who leads that business she had interviewed nine people um so well done for firstly finding nine people to interview but she interviewed nine people for a uh, sales role not one of the nine people asked her about the company's commission scheme but the things that they did ask about were well-being mm. stability and purpose they, yeah. they, were the, they were the three things that came up across the nine commission scheme not one of them now it could yeah. be that some of them were fairly new to the industry so that may not have been top of their agenda but the money thing clearly matters how much you're going to get paid but it, it wasn't um that wasn't the drivers for the people she interviewed so to move quickly on, I've got a couple of questions I want to ask, but also I've got a question that's come in from, from Chris and uh, Christopher, and I think this is a, an interesting question because we all have different varying views of this. You know, what are the panel's views of introducing a share incentive scheme to retain people? Um, I've just answered that very quickly, but I think it, I'm all for it. I think it comes down to a very simple principle that you look after those who look after you. Um, if people are... Um, are bought into the business and are particularly long-term people and back to Dave's point not just the billers but also other people in the organization then if um, the idea is to create or, or clearly it is over a period of time wealth why not share that opportunity with others around you so there are various schemes I've mentioned the EMI scheme a lot of people will be very aware of that um, it's announced it's a very good government approved scheme uh, the point I think most people will understand about EMI schemes is that they're not uh, they're not worth anything much unless you are of the opinion that at some point you're going to sell the business because that's where the people get the benefit at the point of selling the business. Um, so if there's no, you know, you don't see a need or you don't want to sell your business, EMI schemes are not going to be worth really very much to you. But there are other methods uh, of rewarding long term staff that we probably haven't got time to go into today. But the EMI scheme is a good example of a share option scheme that I think generates the level of loyalty that we're looking for and helps us to share the success of our businesses with others. And I think this is different. I was going to say, I think we've got to separate here the difference between offering somebody shares and a share scheme for the employees. And I think there's two different things there. Offering shares is obviously problematic. As again, they're worth nothing unless you sell the business and unless you put that person to become an official director of the business where they can take you know, dividends. If you're looking at a share scheme, as long as it's spread across the business, I think it's a really good incentive mm. to drive the business. And you're right, Paul, an EMI scheme doesn't retain people because you know, unless you're selling the business or you've got an end goal, then you know, it doesn't really retain. I think what we've got to start to drive is if we're going to put those type of things in, then people need to have the communication on what the business is doing from a, a you know a performance point of view, from a sales and from a profit point of view, so they can see what they're potentially going to win or earn out of that from a uh, share option. And so that means communicating the whole of the business and the whole economic capability of the business and how often you pay that scheme out is you know is what it's all about and i think when we start to see that when you, we look at perm recruitment and they say oh, they've got a share scheme the first thing you tell us the client ask the question when was it last paid out and how often does it pay 100 percent out you know and these things are really important so if you're going to put them in i think they're great but they've got to put it in they put in absolutely correctly otherwise they just you know they're not an incentive at all yeah and I, that's what that's what i would uh, say how it is that do it very very carefully yes so think about what are the behaviors you're trying to drive and structure your incentives in the i mean it's the same sort of rules for all kinds of incentives whether they're shares or not but for some people they can end up being gold golden handcuffs 
so where somebody actually it would be a really good idea that they moved on to develop their career somewhere else and they won't because they feel like they've got this big payout coming or you know they they can be counterproductive Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. but but they can be fantastic especially if you're trying to drive somebody to thinking about the benefit of the organization as a whole rather than the benefit of make the decisions they make day to day on their desk because it's good for the desk and so especially if somebody's moving from a desk-based role to a leadership role and you want them to have that slightly more helicopter view you know I think they can be fabulous but really really be careful about what behaviors you're going to drive and how you're going to structure it. So I've got some questions to ask. Joji Hal's got his hand up. So Joji, you actually want to ask a question of you got your hand up by mistake. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to ask the question, then we can come back to Joe and find out what he's doing. So the next question is, you know, let's look at it. Then let's take it from a, you know, we, we've talked sort of round the subject quite a lot. When building a retention strategy, then how would you break it down? <laughs> And Joe's got big hands, apparently. So is Pat Jennings. <laughs> so question is then, when building a retention strategy, how would you break it down? I think it's multi-layered. And I think Heather's going to jump in on this point. Um, it isn't. You, you, you've got to, uh, just to the very the previous point about thinking very hard about um, share schemes or profit share schemes and so forth. You've got to think very hard about the uh, pros and the cons. Uh, equally, retention strategies are not, um, mono, you, they're, they're multi-layered, and I think we come back to the point Dave made earlier about how do you express your appreciation for people? How do you um, provide them with um, a career in the business, not just a fee-earning opportunity? It's about long-term opportunities, and it is about for most people feeling that they're developing, they're growing. Um, so a lot to do with coaching, tuition, learning and development, but also aspiration. Um, So I think those things are super important. I think you've got to be extremely close to your people. Um, So companies that only sit down once a year and compose and have appraisals are way off kilter here. You you need to be very, very close to people. You have a conversation with a member of staff uh, two, three months ago, and you think that person's in a great place, but a lot can happen in 12, 13 weeks. So keeping tight to people, understanding what is going on, not just in their uh, their, 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 their careers but in their personal lives to an extent without being too intrusive is important um, and I could go on and on I think it, it's it's a very deep question and you know the fact that you end up as as the case here with Andy uh, with people who have been in your business for many many years is no accident it takes tremendous effort and a great deal of um, th- of thought and application to ensure that people remain engaged with your company and feel that it's worthy of their lifelong careers to stay with you. It's a big deal. People generally don't, as we see all the time, stay in companies very long any longer. So if you're going to have the kind of um, stickiness that Andy's business clearly has, and I could, I'm sure we could all name others that have, have had equal success as well, then that's something that you really have to work on from a management perspective. I suppose my final point about it is that our people are should be in the absolute epicenter of everything we think about and do. We keep those guys motivated and happy. And surprisingly, or I'm going to say that in inverted commas, we do very well. Our businesses succeed. They make great profits. It's all down to the people. Can I just play devil's advocate slightly? That, that's Honestly. my five quid gone, isn't it? I said you'd say that <laughs> in the first five minutes. Uh, you said it'd be in the first three minutes, but I'll wait until the last 10 minutes. So, so I, I, I agree. I don't disagree with what you're saying. And I think what and Andy's put in the chat about his business and the longevity is fantastic. It really, truly is a wonderful achievement to have such long servers engaged with your business for whole careers. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful um, achievement and all credit to him and his, his business. I think that there has been a real change. Um, and I don't think people stay with all. I think that's very unique and very unusual. Yeah. And I'm not sure that for many recruitment businesses, that's the goal. Because actually, the reality is that, as I say, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Um, the, the reality is that lots of the, the, the current generation of people coming into recruitment have no intention of doing the job they're doing now for the whole of their careers and maybe w- what we should be doing is not focusing on a retention strategy but focusing on a high performance culture strategy where for the period of time that they choose to lend us their skills 
their effort, their ability. They're as high performing as they can be. Um, and then in an adult way, we say, OK, it's time for you. You're now moving on to the next thing you want to do. Um, and we have a grown up way of parting and yep. we wish you luck with the next thing that you choose to do. And that actually we we don't build our organisations because we think we, we shouldn't think we failed because people don't stay with us for 20 years. What, that doesn't take anything away from what Andy's done and the success he's created, because I genuinely think that's brilliant. But I just don't think that's realistic. And we haven't failed if we if people didn't stay. No, with us. I, no I think that's a, it's a completely valid point that at some point people do need to move on. Not everybody, but the vast majority. And I, I think that's an entirely valid. But coming from an HR perspective, it just proves, Heather, doesn't it? You know, you lot, <laughs> you HR lot, you're all awful people. You're there to cull staff and oh. all those things, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. Well, I, think, I think it's interesting is that if we assume as as leaders that the people we're hiring now if we assume that they that they're going to have their career with us as opposed to the career that they own for themselves yes yeah you know, my daughter's 23 and is on her third job and doesn't quite understand you know people who have been in jobs for 15 20 years it's fantastic that they have been because we all know, and Andy's a good example, we all know people who've enjoyed immense, amazing careers yeah. in recruitment. Yeah. But people coming into it now, I, to use that phrase you said, Heather, are almost lending as their time. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, they could lend that time to seven different companies. We'd yeah. love them to stay if they're good. Yeah, but, but let, let it be mutually beneficial for Absolutely. a fixed period of time. Right. Yes, that's, that's true. Okay. So therefore, if we're looking at it in that way, we should be thinking about if we're looking at retention strategies or keeping people engaged in a high performing culture, then you've got three periods. I mean, you've got that initial period when they come into the business, the bit where they start to sort of really perform in the business. And then that final bit is where if they're going to be staying for longer in the business, what's that? So you've got three different real strategies that are part there. And that's all about Absolutely. performing that culture. But this is a different thing. This is the thing that we, you, what we, you're all sort of pulling around is from a perception point of view then how would you get management perception of their retention offering and the employee's perception to be more aligned because i think that's the problem is that the perception of management is very different to the perception of the employees when it comes to alignment in what that retention strategy looks like and Karen Deep said something there about keeping your promises. Uh, you know, that's one of the things. Mm. You know, so what's your views on perception from the management to perception to the employees' view of how they're being retained? I well, love Karen Deep's mm. reference to to honesty and keeping your promises and mm. transparency. I think that's hugely important. And one of the things I think is really valuable when I'm doing management training is to actually introduce managers to the concept of the psychological contract. Right. That deal that we all have with the organisation that we work for of what we're prepared to offer as an employee and what our employer offers in return. And it, that's not just about holidays and and uh, and uh, remuneration. Right. It's about all those other things to do with development and value and trust and uh, and the thank yous and all of those intangibles that impact the psychological contract. And when you start to get managers talking about what impact do you think you're having on that um, intangible relationship with the organisation and on people's decision to give discretionary effort to work hard today as opposed to quiet quitting that people are all over TikTok talking about? You know, just having that debate is fascinating um, with managers to get them to understand what a massive impact they will have on retention and discretionary effort with people. And I think that openness is really important. So it's, I, th I think it's the, the, absolutely right. So in, this, in the same sort of training courses that we run, you know, I talk about in the same sort of vein that I talk about, you know, how you make people feel. Yeah. And part of that is a KPI that I use. And the KPI is simple, your kept promise index. So if you're going to keep a promise to somebody, you know, do you actually keep the promise? Do you actually say something and then deliver on that promise? Because if you don't, then they can start to not delivering on their promises back to you. So you can be held accountable for the promises that you give and how you, how you deliver those promises. And I think as a manager, that's the bit that you start to see how you make people feel. Do you make them feel more important? Do you make them feel equally as important? Or do you make them feel less important? And sometimes it's just those little things that you say, yeah, I promise to do that, but I haven't had time to do it as yet. They're the bits that start to grow and grow yeah, and grow. And that's why people start to leave and switch people off. So I think 
think it's really important that you have that KPI is what, what is your KEP promise index? What have you promised to deliver and what have you delivered and what haven't you delivered? Hmm. I think it's important for that because that's the difference between the perception and reality, especially if you're putting on your website that you are honest and you are all about your staff. But then if you're not delivering your KPI, then that's a problem. You, you know, your kept promise index is a problem to you. Yeah, and I think you're right, Howard. Look, it's the thing we always talk about uh, from a business uh, development perspective, developing a trusted advisor position. But that applies internally to the points you guys have made. And I think uh, making sure that uh, you keep your your promises, build trust. And we all know that building trust is uh, something that takes a lengthy period of time. And it's a very, very precious commodity when you have it, you have someone's trust and it takes a nanosecond to lose it. When you lose it, it's almost impossible to get it back. Now, we know that applies to developing relationships with our clients, but it's equally important internally with our people. Just another point I'd add to this, and that is something we haven't said, but I think is a driver here. And that's succession planning. You know, one of the reasons that people are often kind of, uh, re, you know, keep people on for too long, perhaps, or are nervous to move them to other areas of the business, or, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, uh, jokingly, but, you know, putting up with mediocrity is because there's no one to step into that individual's shoes. And I think one of the, the reasons that, um, you know, one of the things that people, and in businesses really need to be focused on is consistently considering how they're going to um, ultimately replace people. How do you get people in play who have got talent and potential ready to take on a new role where they're going to succeed and so that you gain a sense of security and you're giving people the opportunity to consistently, if they wish to, move forward? And where we see uh, people, I think, procrastinating around individuals it's often because they have no one in the business ready to step up and take over and that in itself can cause all sorts of issues within an organization dave anything you want to add to that i'm just going to say i think part part, part of it for me is that um any retention strategy that doesn't involve conversations with all of our people isn't really a retention strategy you, know, you can have a business strategy <clears throat> and have your leaders involved and you can have a financial strategy with your finance team involved, but you can't have a retention strategy that doesn't involve everybody in the business. So here's a question, last question to finish. I want a really snappy answer because obviously we're pushed on time now. Okay, what do you see then as the biggest failing in any retention strategy? And I think, Dave, you've, you've answered that question there. <laughs> but it's not written down. Most retention strategies are in the heads of the leaders. I, th I think it's attention to detail. It's the detail that matters. You know, we can all write very nice policies and procedures, but it's making, it's paying attention, looking, you know, looking at the detail. It's the tiny touches that make a difference to people. It's the kind words, the gestures, not necessarily the big finance. It's making people feel valued. And for me, it's not retention strategy at all. It's not recruiting the right people in the first place. So for me, it's actually before retention. It's about recruiting. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think you're right. And I think I, I'm going to sort of trig off Dave's comment there. If you're building a retention strategy, you need to be speaking to everybody. So it's the people in the room that do develop the retention strategy. So if it's just the owners of the business developing a retention strategy, but they've got no idea what the 20 year old person that sat in the desk actually wants, then that's the problem um, from there. So I think there's lots we can talk about retention and we can keep talking about this for quite some time. But I think, you know, you, you, Heather's your comment there it is about where, who we recruit first and foremost. And is it a retention strategy that we actually want or is it something bigger and better that we want? So next week, we start a whole new series of webinars. We've got some guest speakers coming in. So next week, we're going to be talking about marketing. We've got Robert Woodford, who's the MD of the Marketing Junction, coming in. And he'll be discussing what marketing strategies will help LGCs develop in 2023, because we know marketing is becoming more and more the mainstream part of recruitment. And have we got our marketing strategies right? So next week should be a really interesting conversation. We're really interested in what, what Rob has to say. So once again, thanks very much for this week. Thank you for attending. Thanks for all your input, Heather, Dave, and Paul. Thanks for Pleasure. all the disagreement between us. <laughs> and I shall see you all next week. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Much. Take good Bye. care. Bye, Bye now. Thank you.